Let's talk about the murder strike, a technique I absolutely hate. Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatore. Now, there's one technique which I have not devoted much, practically no attention to over the years, many years that I've been running this channel, and that is the murder strike. Indeed, it's primarily known from Talhofer, um, uh, Mordschlag, the, the German uh, name of it, and there are different versions. There's versions where you strike with the guard, there's versions where you strike with the pommel, but the basic characteristic of this, I'll just refer to it as a murder strike in this video, the basic characteristics are that you are holding the blade and striking with the hilt. What kind of crazy person would do that? I hear lots of people yell. And then you find the opposite uh, group of people who've been doing uh, German um, KDF martial arts, um, Lichtenau based martial arts for many, many years, will leap to its defense and say, oh, it's absolutely fine to grab a blade. And we'll do demonstrations like I did recently of grabbing sharp blades with hands. And yes, indeed, you can do it. I should point out, incidentally, this is not a sharpened blade, but I will be demonstrating sharpened blades in a little bit further on. And so uh, people will leap to the fence and explain all the reasons why in certain circumstances and done in the right way it is fine to put your hand on a blade. There are different ways of gripping it. You can apply pressure to the flats and make sure you don't hit the edges or, or indeed you might be wearing gloves um, and then we talk about how um, swords have different types of edge geometry to something like a kitchen knife which most people are more familiar with um, and there are all of these things. Um, now it should be said that half swording, that is using your sword like this, supporting the blade halfway up the blade is done in a lot of medieval martial arts. Equally, uh, if someone cuts at me and I cross their uh, attack and I go in for a grab on their sword in order to get my sword out and uh, offend them back while I detain, push, command, control their sword, or any other weapon, it might be, um, it might be a rondel dagger or uh, whatever, um, then absolutely there's loads of that. But the Mordschlag is somewhat different to those because it means you grab the entire blade with both your hands and in most of the treatises showing it, it shows it with bare naked hands like I've got here on the blade and you strike the opponent with the hilt. Why would you do that? Well, the standard HEMA answer to that question is it's against an armoured opponent. It's when you're not in armour, or you might be in armour, but your opponent's wearing armour and swords are not very effective against armour because you can't just cut through plate armour. You can bash a person really hard, but it's not going to do an awful lot. And swords are balanced towards the hand, so they are heavy at the hilt end rather than heavy at the tip end, like something like a, a poleaxe or a warhammer or a mace. So therefore it's turning your sword into a mace to hit the armoured opponent around the head and fell them. I have got so many issues with this, but before I go on, I want to have a very quick word about the sponsors for this video, who are NordVPN. Much like wearing armour of any kind in the medieval period, NordVPN is here to help protect you. And much like a sword, NordVPN is here to bring you liberty. If you haven't checked out Nord yet, then you can use my link below, which is nordvpn.com slash scholargladiatoria. Absolutely risk-free. Much like wearing good armour, Nord offers you great security and peace of mind. You can secure your personal data and your internet access. Activity. All of your personal data is protected behind a wall of next generation encryption. What's more is NordVPN servers are ultra fast. You don't have to choose between security and speed. Why not have both? If like me you have to share massive files securely then with Nord you can do that thanks to the hundreds of person to person servers. Moreover with Nord due to all of the international servers that you can use and connect to very very easily it means that you can access things which you might not be able to access in your own country and I'll tell you in my business Business, I know loads and loads of people using NordVPN because it enables them to access resources, research, even videos on the internet they wouldn't be able to do in the countries that they operate in. So you need to check out nordvpn.com slash scholargladiatoria, link below. It's absolutely risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. So thanks for watching, now let's get back to the main content of this video and that is the Mordschlag. So what are the basic um, explanations for why we use it? The basic explanations that normal HEMA people would say is it's an anti-armor technique. You could be like me in um, not in armor or you might be wearing armor of some kind, could be light armor, medium armor, heavy armor, full plate, but your opponent is in armor. Okay and for some reason you have decided not to use your sword conventionally, not to use it in half-sorting, 
not to go in and grapple with them, but you have decided to, in the moment, give a whopping great smash with the back end of your sword, either with the cross guard, using it a bit like a warhammer or a pick, or using the pommel a bit like a mace. Now, the first thing I should say is that there are specialised armoured fighting swords. We see these in treatises. For example, you see them in Talhofer, you see them in Fiore de Liberi, you see them in Codex Volestein, you see them in Palisette de Mare. You see them in several different treatises, and if we only had them in treatises, you could conclude that these are some wacky kind of knightly dueling or perhaps even judicial dueling type of weapon. Maybe they existed, maybe they didn't, we don't really know. Uh, but the simple fact is that we know they did actually exist, okay? Because there are um, similar and related swords surviving. I found the first one of these, or I, for me personally, I won't say I discovered it, but I, for the first time in my life that I saw a real one was when I was in Krakow in Poland, many, many years ago now, but I've taught a couple of times out there, and I was in Wawel Castle in Krakow, and indeed there they have a specialised armoured fighting sword where the blade is like a long straight bar, so you can't cut with it, but you can thrust with it because it's very pointy and very stiff, you can half sword with it, you can swing it and use it like a bar mace, uh, and of course you can thrust with it. Um, and the cross guard is pointed exactly like Filippo Vardi describes, for example, another example of a treatise which has it in. And the pommel is a big, great, sort of sp almost spiky square lump, okay? So it's like a mace head. So it, as a sword, it looks like a horrible, great, big, cumbersome, weird thing. But as a specialised armoured fighting sword, it makes an awful lot of sense. There wasn't only one kind of specialised armoured sword, there are others as well. For example, Filippo Vardi I mentioned, he talks about a type of sword which is blunt all the way up the blade and, and is only edged at the very tip. But he says you have pointed cross guard and you have a pointed pommel. Fury Delivery shows the same type. His seems more to have a blunt region rather than necessarily being all the way blunt to the tip. Um, has a blunt region around here, talk more about that in a second. He also has a spiked guard and a spiked pommel. And he has another version, which is a real novelty, and we don't know of any surviving ones of these, we don't even know if they were actually made, that has a big spiky pommel um, and a spiked cross guard, and it has a sliding weight. Um, and I know Mark Lancaster from the Exiles has had a replica of one of these, obviously speculative, because they're in unsurviving, but with a sliding weight. So whichever end you swing, the sliding weight goes to that end and increases the momentum. Equally, if we look at other ones, if we look at Talhofer, we find spiked guards and spiked pommels. The same thing in Codex Volestein, we find spiky, big spiky pommels, um, a bit like the one shown in uh, Fury. And we find a similar one later on in Palos Hector Mare, although Palos Hector Mare is kind of copying earlier treatises. So whether he actually had any like this available to him, we don't know. Um, but he certainly saw them in earlier treatises and reconstructed them in his drawings. Um, now, I talked about that blunt portion of the blade. If we go to Vienna, if we go to the um, the Royal Arsenal, essentially, in, in Vienna, then there is an armoured fighting sword which has a recessed and blunt region of the blade up here, specifically to make half-swording easier. Now, a lot of people will point out, ah, oh, but the swords shown in most treatises used for half-sorting, for example, are just normal swords. Yes, but it's clear that there were some specialised armoured fighting swords which were made to accentuate the ease of use of those things. So, for example, if you make a blunt section of the blade, it's going to be easier to half-sword with it. You'll still be able to cut above and below that, you'll still be able to thrust, but it just means that if you're predominantly fighting in armour or against people in armour, then that is now an easier weapon to do half-sorting with. So let's get back to the Mordschlag. Clearly, these weapons, which have pointed guards and pointed pommels, are designed to hit with the rear end. And we see this in German treatises, we see this in Italian, uh, we see striking with the pommel and the cross guard in Fury and uh, Vardi. In fact, Fury shows a guard position where he's got a sword which kind of has two ends on it, it has a crossbar up here as well. But he is holding the hilt end back, ready to strike with the hilt end. So we could say that the Mordschlag is heavily implied, I mean I would say it's in Fiore, although he doesn't actually show striking with the hilt like that, um, but he shows you being ready to do it, so I'd say it's in there. 
It's most famously represented the Mordschlag hitting with, the, or rather the murder strike, I said I'd use English, didn't I? Um, hitting with the uh, hilt end is most famously perhaps shown in Talhofer because this is a treatise which lots of people have had access to for a long, long time and the pictures are very graphic and nicely done. Um, and so absolutely, some people might think of it as a German technique, but I'd say it's just a universal, you find it in all of the longsword um, traditions that we know of, okay? So striking with a hilt. And we know that these specialised armoured fighting swords with spiked guards and spiked pommels survived. And clearly, unless you're hitting someone with a hilt end, there isn't a huge amount to having a huge amount of point to having a spiked pommel, for example. I mean, yes, you strike with the pommel, but it's just percussive force. If you've actually got a spiked pommel, which makes it very hard to hold conventionally, then it does heavily imply striking with the back end. So given that we know that this was done in uh, German sources and Italian sources, and probably therefore France, England, Spain, everywhere else, but we just don't have treatises from those places for longsword. Um, given that we know that it was done, very likely, and we know that the surviving swords survive, there are some swords which clearly are from that tradition. Why do I hate it so much? Well, quite simply because of the answer. Why would you do it? So the, the answer is because it's an armoured opponent, okay? Because it's an armoured opponent, I'm going to resort to hitting them with the hilt end of my sword. Now to do that, I have to grab this blade. Now this blade, as you can see here, is not cutting my hands. It, this is uh, almost sharp, but it's not had the final sharpen put on it. So it's a very thin edge. It is not comfortable to hold, I can assure you. Not only is this uncomfortable to hold, and this isn't really sharp, it is very unpleasant to swing with any, I mean, I'm swinging it quite slowly and calmly. If I actually swing it with force, with the intention of hitting someone hard, that's really uncomfortable on my hands. And this isn't a sharp one, okay? If I now put this sword down, uh, and I go to a completely blunt one. A lot of people in HEMA train with FEDA or FEDERSCHWERT or blunt swords, okay? Now, a lot of people from using these or indeed using something like a synthetic, like a nylon, will be like, oh, I don't have any problem doing the, uh, the murder strike. I, I get it to work for me in sparring. Yeah, but number one, you're wearing gloves. Number two, which the Mordschlag is often shown not even wearing gloves. Um, but not only are you doing that, but also you're doing it with a completely blunt weapon. Okay, yeah, I can, I can grab it. It's a bit flexible, Ooh, wangs around. But yeah, I can happily swing, uh, swing a uh, feather around my, around my head, smashing the things in my garage. It's not a big problem to me. Notice the point came past me there. I'll talk about that in a second. No problem with a feather. It becomes much, much less pleasant with a, what I would call a semi-sharp or almost sharp sword. Much, much less pleasant, especially because it's pointy at this end as well. Again, I'll come back to that. Now I go to a sharp sword. <laughs> um, so do you know what? Yes, I can hold it, but do I want to go outside and hit a pell like this? Hell no, I just don't want to do that. Now. If, you're, if you've decided to specialise your training in giving the murder strike and holding sharp blades by the blade end and hitting helmeted heads hard or any other part of an armoured opponent hard, um, now bear in mind, yes, okay, you might be able to safely build up the momentum in that blade. What happens when it hits the other, the other thing, okay? When it hits a helmet or hits a breastplate or someone parries, you've now got a shockwave going straight down your weapon into your hands. It's horrible. I literally don't, I thought, when I came to shoot this video, I thought I'm gonna demonstrate this and explain to people how horrible it is. <laughs> and I started setting that up and I decided, do you know what, this is f stupid. I'm not gonna do it. The risk to my hands from a sharp blade, it is not, for one video, it is not worth me risking that. Not even for science. <laughs> um, I just don't wanna do it. So that's my first problem. My first problem is gripping a sharp blade with both hands here, especially if it's oily. I'll tell you, this blade's quite oily and it's quite slippy in my hands. Uh, yeah, I can move it around. This is a very sharp sword. It will cut paper. Um, I can do this. Do I want to swing it harder than this? No. Do I want to hit a solid target like an armoured opponent? No. Do I want to swing it at someone who might parry or hit this weapon or stop it in its travel? Hell no! I just don't want to do it, okay? That's the first problem. The second problem, which I've already heavily implied and basically mentioned to you, is the point, okay? The further that that hilt gets away from me to hitting someone, 
the more the point is now pointing straight at my crotch. And yeah, okay, it might be pointing at different parts of my body if, I, if I'm coming in at slightly different angles, but I just don't want to do that. I don't, with a person in front of me who possibly wants me dead, I don't want to turn my weapon around and point it at myself. Now, admittedly, if I was in armor, that would be slightly different. And some people would say, Matt, isn't that the same if you're gripping the sword in armor? No, okay? First of all, would I want to do any of this in leather gloves? No, not really, for all of the reasons I've just said. Yes, it would be slightly safer and slightly more bearable in leather gloves than in bare hands. And some people will go, oh, Matt, but what about, uh, what about gauntlets? Um, well, you know, gauntlets, yep, super protective on the outside. On the inside, they're just leather gloves, okay? So in terms of gripping a sword and hitting hard objects with it, it is no different gripping it with leather gloves or a gauntlet because on the inside, a gauntlet is got leather gloves. Now, some people might think of exceptions and go, Matt, couldn't you wear mail, okay, chain mail on the inside of the gloves? Yes, you could. Yes, you could do that. It's got lots of disadvantages. It makes it harder to grab things and keep hold of things and all this kind of stuff. Um, but if you wanted to make specialised gauntlets or gloves for grabbing blades, yes, they did it. Yes, you could do it. But that wasn't what normally happened. And to reiterate and go back to the blunt sword for my own uh, safety, uh, most of the treatises that show this being done are showing it in bare hands or occasionally in gauntlets. And if they show it in gauntlets, then remember that the gauntlets have only got leather on the inside. Sometimes quite thin leather as well, actually. So we've got, first of all, it is not nice to swing and hold on to something by a sharp blade that might impact something hard. Secondly, the point pointing towards you, not a big fan of it. Here is the third final, and I think most damning thing against the murder strike. There are like a dozen other things you could do. So say, for example, I am like here, I'm wearing a gambeson and I got a hat, okay? Believe it or not, this hat provides a little bit of protection. It's a bit of uh, wool fabric and, and linen liner inside between an opponent's blade and my scalp, which when you've got no hair like me is actually quite good. Um, it's, it's a bit like having hair actually in terms of impact resistance. So it's something, it's not a lot, but it's something. So I do have some protection on, and indeed, um, if I was expecting a fight, I would probably, in fact, I would definitely, uh, based on my um, experience, be wearing gloves, okay? So I would go around town wearing gloves, no question. So let's assume in a best case scenario, I am wearing a good gambeson, a hat, and gloves, and this is my civilian uh, life. For some reason, uh, let's say that I'm quite uh, wealthy. Someone's decided to beat me up and take me ransom so that my family have to pay a large sum to get me back. And they send an armored knight out to get me, <laughs> okay? Um, now, things like this did kind of happen if we look at the history of the Medici and people of families like that, the Borgias in, in Italy. These kind of inter-family wars did happen and similar-ish things happened in the Wars of the Roses in England as well. Um, and so it could happen that I would be going around in my civilian clothes with gloves on, with a long sword, and, and an armoured knight comes at me, okay? What choices do I have? Well, obviously I can run away, I can try and find a big weapon like a pole axe, okay? Yes, <laughs> if I can. But let's assume this is all I've got and I can't run away. If I have to fight the armoured opponent, am I going to think, I know what I'll do? I'll pull my sharp longsword out, I will just hold it with my hands, and I will clout him around the head um, with my murder strike. No, okay? It's not what I would personally choose to do. And I understand other people's mileage on this might vary, and people might have different opinions. But for me personally, no. I want to be holding on to this end of my sword, and yes, sometimes half sorting. So my sword is gonna transition between these two holds. At no point would I personally think to change it through to a, to a, a murder strike grip. Um, and here are the reasons. If they're wearing armor, they've got a helmet on. Lots of people in the world get bashed on helmets in reenactment and um, HMB type combat and HEMA and other things, even you know sports, um, <laughs> hockey or whatever. On a regular basis, helmets are literally designed to be bashed on the head. This is not a particularly effective mace or hammer. But even if this was an effective mace or hammer, like this Warhammer here, those helmets are literally designed to be hit 
on the head with those weapons. So it's not a magic turn the lights off solution to putting someone out of action. Hitting them on the head with a, a, a pommel is probably, probably, I would say definitely not as effective as hitting them with a mace. And hitting them with a mace on the head isn't going to instantly put them out of action. So you're probably only going to get one swing at their head. And then what? Okay, you, you stand a huge uh, danger of getting disarmed or your weapon uh, cutting into your own hands or your point <laughs> jabbing you in the crotch or whatever. Huge amount of danger involved. Um, what other things could I do? Well, as the standard fencing, okay? So I could, I could keep the person at bay. I can be targeting my thrusts at their openings, um, at their crotch, their uh, inner elbow, their armpits. Um, absolutely, I can come in for half sorting. Um, I can do grabbing and grappling. I could try and throw them on the ground. Um, if, they, if they take a big swing at me, indeed, I could, I could um, cover against that swing, come in and, uh, and um, arm wrap them and try and put them, um, throw them on the floor. I could just wrestle them. I could charge in. Um, if they take a massive great swing at me, I can just charge in under a half sword block, parrying that, come in and, and go straight to grappling. Um, there are so many things I can do. <laughs> um, and the murder strike is not at all one that I would like to do. The other thing I want to mention as a parting thought as well is that some swords a murder strike might be more appropriate with than others. If we go back to that sword in Vavil Castle in Krakow, that has a square section and totally stiff blade. It's like, imagine a giant crowbar with a cross guard. In that situation, absolutely, grabbing the back end of it might seem to make some kind of sense because at the end of the day, it's kind of functionally a pole axe at that point. You've got a, a large square bar that's easy to hold onto and it's pretty damned rigid and you're now swinging a heavy mace head or cross guard at them. That makes some degree of sense. But a sword that has any degree of flex in it, and this is a very stiff sword, but even this has some flex in it. If you try and practice the uh, murder strike with a feather, feather shirt, which is quite flexible, it's horrible. It bends all over the place. However, I have to concede that some swords, like this very stiff um, sword here, it feels okay with, but it's still horrible to hold. And I just think there's so many other things that I would rather do against the armoured opponent rather than a murder strike. So, to conclude, yes, it is historical. I think we can verify it. We can verify the murder strike from the sources. We can see that there are certain swords that are specialised for armoured fighting, um, for half sorting, but additionally, that you could probably, like the one in Vavil Castle, use quite easily for a murder strike. And yes, perhaps with those, it makes more sense. So it absolutely happened, and I accept that some people love this technique and use it today. Inspiring, although admittedly with blunt swords, very different to a sharp sword. I would issue a challenge to anyone to go out and hit, hold it onto a sharp sword, I mean a really sharp sword, and bash a pell, uh, you know, like a tire or something, or a post, with a mord schlag. But do you know what? With a murder strike, I, I, I don't want to issue that challenge because I think that you stand a very large chance of getting a horrible injury. And I don't want to be responsible for that and I don't want that to happen to you. So there we go. I am not a fan of the murder strike and many of you might think that I'm a HEMA purist and in some ways I am. I do believe that our research has to be based on historical sources. I do think that we should try and match up our training and our goals towards some of the contexts of what they were doing historically in period. I think there's a, sometimes there's a, a disconnection between modern sport and what they were actually aiming towards in the treatises, absolutely. So in some senses I am a purist but there are some techniques in historical treatises that I do not like and I suspect, certainly in the case of some medieval treatises, certainly in the case of Talhofer in specific, that sometimes techniques were put in there for wow factor, not necessarily because they would have advised their students to actually do that in combat. And that's one of the elephants in the room we're interpreting uh, when we're interpreting historical sources, that you have to always ask, 
why is this technique in there? These aren't instruction manuals for beginners. These aren't instruction manuals for 21st century people like you and me. These are, in the case of Talhofer, a picture book of selected finishing moves, or very mu much of them are finishing moves, sometimes maybe a small short sequence of moves that get you to a finishing move, to show off what they knew and what they could do, uh, but not necessarily what would have been advisable to try in real combat. And that's unfortunately something we do have to admit. Right, I hope this has been interesting. Thanks a lot for watching. Check out those links below and I will see you back on the channel really soon for another video. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.